to the Welcome to the Fall 2022 Software Preservation Network Forum. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar. My name is Sarah Rue. I'm the Reserve Specialist for Wichita State University Libraries and a member of the Software Preservation Network's Community Engagement Collaborative. The CEC organizes Software Preservation Community Forums as often as we can, which is about twice a year. The purpose of these forums is to bring together colleagues across professional and disciplinary communities to participate in an hour-long discussion on topics related to software curation, preservation, and reuse. Thank you for being a part of the software preservation community today. Our topic for today is building a video game collection community Q&A. This is a round table discussion on building solidarity with related organizations and communities to win an improved exemption in the Digital Millennium Copyright Act for video games. This is part two of this forum topic and is going to focus on our community questions remaining from part one. A recording of part one, building a video game collection legal considerations for preservation can be found on the Software Preservation Network website. And we are going to be providing links to those in the chat. My co-facilitators today from the CC are Jacob Zabrowski from the Getty Research Institute, Jess Farrell from Educopia Institute and Community Coordinator for our Software Preservation Network and Bit Curator Consortium, Ethan Gates from Yale University Library, Diane Dietrich from Cornell University Library, Stan Gunn from UVA, and Caitlin Perry from Educopia. Just a little housekeeping before we get started. If you have questions during the presentation, please enter them using our Google form that will be added to the chat. Using this form lets us keep questions and try to get answers for them later if we don't have time to address today, which is how we ended up with uh, this forum. Um, I will bring them up during our moderated discussion and we'll also have dedicated time for questions from the audience at the end. I would also like to remind everyone that this form is being recorded. We'll share notes with all registrants shortly after the program and we'll share the recording publicly in a few weeks. The SPIN form is governed by the SPIN code of conduct. If you're being harassed or see someone being harassed, please notify our code of conduct monitor at any time during the call via direct chat. Our code of conduct monitor for today is Jess Farrell. All right, let's get right into things. So as this is part two, um, I do want to begin with just a high level overview of the Digital, Digital Millennium Copyright Act, as well as a brief reminder of the questions that were addressed in part one. The Digital, Digital Millennium Copyright Act was signed into law in 1998. It bars the creation of technology, devices, or services intended to circumvent measures that control access to copyrighted works as per Wikipedia. These measures are commonly referred to as digital rights management. The, DC, the DMCA is subject to a review process that takes place every three years. The most recent review took place in 2021, and these reviews result in exemptions for anti-circumvention of access controls for certain media. In recent years, there has been growing advocacy for video games to be included in these exemptions to allow for long-term preservation access. So part one um, addressed the following questions, how video game collections are built and curated, how these collections are currently being preserved, what is the current state of preservation and access without the exemption, what would change if the community had an expanded DMCA exemption and could rely on principles of fair use to provide access to their collections. So for part two, we're going to be addressing some of the um, community questions that uh, we were unable to cover during that previous forum, and we've grouped them into three themes. We have legal implications for collecting organizations, community and collaboration, and trends in video game collecting. Um, in addition to our panelists from part one, we are happy to announce Kendra Albert will be joining us for this forum, as well as our three previous guests. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our panelists. Kendra Albert is a technology lawyer and scholar of computing, gender, and society. They are a clinical instructor at the Cyber Law Clinic at Harvard Law School, where they teach students to practice technology law. They've worked with SPIN on a number of projects around legal issues for software preservation, including multiple Section 1201 exemptions. As digital curator at The Strong, Andrew Borman coordinates the museum's efforts related to digital preservation of electronic games. He has long taken an active role in game preservation, focusing on the preservation of unreleased game prototypes and developmental material. Phil Salvador is the library director at the Video Game History Foundation, where he manages the foundation's collection of digital and physical materials related to the history of video games. But most importantly, he is a friend to all birds. Finally, Brandon Butler is the Director of Information Policy at the University of Virginia and SPIN's Law and Policy Advisor. He oversees SPIN's policy agenda and legal strategy for securing lawful preservation, sharing, and reuse of software. 
Uh, this form will run through some of our unanswered questions from part one, and we are going to have time uh, at least 15 minutes of totally open Q&A from our audience today. All right, so let's get things going um, as much time as possible. So we're going to start with questions regarding the legal implications for collecting organizations. Um, our first one from a previous audience member, the, they described that it appears as though it is more difficult to establish a risk-based collection level approach to copyright issues for audiovisual media such as games than for other types of assets like books and serials. So would the panel agree with this characterization? And if so, what are your thoughts on why this would be the case? Mr. Cotter, I have um, so uh, I want to jump in on that one for sure because it's um, uh, and I know Kendra will want to jump in probably too because it's a thing that practitioners like us hear a lot in this uh, kind of cultural heritage, public interest uh, context. Uh, the sense that, and it's certainly not just video games, and the questioner asks the question in a very astute way. It's sort of audiovisual generally. Um, and and it, this kind of question comes up also about music. It, it's essentially, you know, the perception that there is more risk associated with, you know, a, a video game or a movie than with a dusty old tome, right? And it's absolutely true that that appears to be the case. It is not the case, um, at least not legally. That is, there is no meaningful legal distinction between these different kinds of materials. It is the same copyright law that applies to them all, and especially the same fair use law and the same limitations and exemptions to a large extent. Now, you know, I'll walk that back instantly. There are nasty little carve outs in like section 108 for audiovisual materials. Um, but again, this is why we love fair use. Fair use doesn't have any nasty little carve outs. It's, uh, it's general. And so the lot and when when you're thinking about something like risk management right what you're really doing is sort of you're not trying to live within the nooks and crannies of a very specific exception you're trying to think holistically you know is this fair and defensible and what are the odds somebody's going to get mad and what are the odds they're going to come and get me and you know and and make a stink and make my life hard right and that kind of calculation may appear to be different, again, in the context of kind of like pop culture, you might even say AV materials. The I think that is an artifact of the, especially the bad old days of file sharing and the times when, you know, we sort of all felt like the internet was a place where you could do a lot of stuff. But one thing that you might avoid doing is sharing music because you could get sued for your entire, you know, future earning potential. Um, so anyway, I, I guess I just want to say, don't don't be afraid to to when you're thinking holistically and not kind of hyper technically. When you're thinking holistically about risk management, the same basic principles really do apply. There's not a there's not a, a one law for music and video games and another law or another level of risk for other kinds of stuff. Um. I really appreciate Brandon opening with that because I'm going to do the hyper technical part, um, uh, which is to say that like it is true from a copyright law perspective that it's not one you know there's not one set of rules for uh, you know books and another set of rules for video games, um, but once you get into section 1201 of the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, it's actually true there is one set of rules for software that's not video games and one set of rules for video games. Um, so I think that it, I think that. I think that I want to like really emphasize what Brandon is saying, which is that I think this is not a reason to not do it at all or assume that the risk level is so high that it's not worth doing. I think one reason it can be tricky to do some kinds of risk-based collection level approaches is also because the types of risk come from uh, different places and are kind of uh, at a different different level of technicalness um, than might be true in the context of like book preservation or other kinds of um, other kinds of works. And um, so like you may have to answer questions about uh, like the, the types of digital rights management tools that the video game employed in order to assess like to do a risk based collection approach and that's actually a, maybe a harder question to answer than like what year was this book published at least in many senses right so I think that um, the reality is that I think that it is true that like 
there, uh, the risk is not so high that it's not worth doing, but that there are real challenges around how video games in particular have been characterized by uh, video game publishers, developers, and to some extent, I think sort of more, more generally culturally, that has made it trickier to kind of engage in the types of traditional preservation activity that we we see in other areas. In addition to the fact that the um, just the sheer like potential technical complexity of some of these types of preservation work may may be more significant. Um, so I think that that's sort of my one addendum to what Brandon is saying, and you know. I unfortunately had to miss the last one of these because I had COVID. Um, so I'm very excited to be here uh, for all of the harder versions of the questions. Um, uh, really glad we got the easy stuff out of the way. But I think if it's helpful, I'm happy to also talk in more detail about sort of how the video game specific 1201 exemptions work. Um, and, uh, because I think that can drive some of this risk categorization. Um, but I also don't wanna, don't wanna repeat the, the previous session if that feels not useful. All right, I was seeing some nods from panelists, but I'll look vaguely at Sarah's at Sarah's Zoom direction and see if like you've got we've got time. So this okay. the focus of this is to give um, to answer questions, and so uh, if it'll be helpful to add a little bit more um, specifics on the caveats of that twelve hundred one, then definitely do so. Yeah. So I think one thing to note uh, about the twelve hundred one exemptions for video games, specifically in the context of the United States, is that um, they don't. Uh, in contrast to the more general software preservation exceptions, they don't allow remote access to video games. Um, and that was the subject of basically all of the debate, <laughs> not all of it, most of the debate during the last round of the 1201 video game cycle. Um, the other tricky bit here is actually something that some of the other questions we're gonna answer get to. So I'll sort of like flag it and then kind of uh, keep going, which is this idea that like, you know, if you have a book, uh, it is at least generally speaking likely that if you have the physical book, you have the entire book. Um, and, uh, you know, there are probably there are 100 exceptions. I'm sure five of them are going to show up in chat and the other 12 will be on Twitter. Um, but, you know, generally speaking, when we think about kind of certain kinds of works, you if you have the physical object, you have the complete version. Um, one challenge in the 1201 context has been even how to think about video games as objects, right? Um, how to think about updates, how to think about uh, sort of like daisy, like, you know, release day patches, right? Things like that. Um, and I think that's driven a lot of the concerns in the 1201 space about how to, um, uh, thank you, Andrew. I appreciate, I appreciate you making true, uh, yeah. Um, the, uh, but yeah, I think the sort of this question of like, how uh, even if you have a physical object associated with the work, the need to uh, um, uh, the need to kind of have access to external servers or access to external information, um, I think has made it more complicated to kind of think about risk-based collections. Oh, internet, uh, Andrew has the entire the entire internet right there in that box. Uh, so at least fortunately for that, we're all set. Um, uh, but yeah, so I think as we think about risk-based characterization, there's some of that that is done that is a problem because of the law, right? Um, and that part we're working on, um, but there's some of that that's also a problem just because of the types of technical, uh, uh, like the technical systems in video game and software preservation, and that I think can make it a little bit harder. Um, so I'll stop there and happy to happy to hear from, you know, other folks if they have thoughts. No, I think you're just right on. I mean, access is the thing that we think about most and that's where kind of we get the most pushback of like, hey, you know, I live in a different country. I'd like to access something, but that'll come up later in, in later questions. So honestly, we assume fair use for a lot of what we do. Uh, we, we do the preservation things that need to happen uh, and we get into more detail, but we try not to let that bog us down and stop us from doing the things that are important. Yeah, I think the only thing I have to add is just from experience with what Brandon was mentioning with some of the perception issues. Um, prior to working at the Video Game History Foundation, I was doing media librarianship at American University in DC. And when questions came up about digitizing things, doing remote access, it was the same question where it's like, well, movies, that's like a fun thing, right? Like that's not the same thing as books. It's not scholarly. So that's always just an ongoing conversation is stressing that there are research purposes for these things and getting people comfortable with the idea that games can be texts and this kind of 
broader conversation beyond the scope of this panel right now, but that plays into it too, for sure. Can I just plus one on that real fast, which I think, uh, you know, there is somehow this perception that like, uh, like no one ever read a preserved book for fun. Um, but yet the instant you're talking about video games, like, oh my God, someone somewhere might enjoy it, right? Um, and I think like that's tricky because we both want to emphasize, because it's true that there's really important scholarly impact here. But I think for me, it's also, um, it's also difficult to talk about this in a context in which, um, like to also just really note that like, you know, folks like engage with preserved works for a variety of reasons. And we want to prioritize people's ability to have access to the scholarly canon while not necessarily like, uh, yeah, uh, while not necessarily like uh, basically restricting the fair use analysis so much mm -hmm. that the idea that someone might somewhere have a good time is going to like cause problems down the line. And, and, and you know, the, the flip side of that is also really interesting, which is, you know, um, absolutely, we should stand up and sort of fight for the right of users to enjoy the things we preserve. Um, and that to the extent that someone is engaged in sort of hardcore scholarship um, or teaching, uh, the fact that something used to be fun or, you know, <laughs> the fact that something was made to be fun is great from a fair use point of view, right? Because it just doesn't, it doesn't get much more transformative than taking something that was played and turning it into something that is read as scholarship or um, experienced in a classroom as pedagogy, uh, et cetera. So, um, uh, so in some ways, right, you're closer to the heart of fair use when you're doing scholarship about games than you are when you're doing scholarship about scholarship because you are taking something farther away from what it was meant to be and, and adding more value and putting it in front of different eyeballs. Excellent. Um, so one of our questioners was interested in legal challenges of digital only online gaming. So where do we stand with preserving these games and where might the future be? Well, I think this goes back to a conversation we had last time and what does it mean to preserve a video game? Uh, if the goal is to play, to have a playable copy of every online digital game, that's just not going to happen. So there are other things that we can do to help preserve the history of what these games are, what they were, uh, and all of that. But I'm sure Brandon can speak better to, the, to this than I. R really right now, especially with games that are online, the exemptions really aren't uh, there for a lot of that content, but I'll let somebody else jump in. I think Brandon might be frozen, um, yep. which maybe is a maybe is a statement about the state of preservation of digital only online gaming. Um, so yeah, I think I would just agree with Andrew. I think that like. Um, in some ways, like we haven't really, like, I think we are just getting to the point where the exemptions actually cover much of the preservation activity for traditionally like distributed games. <laughs> like, like we're still working on that. And I like, part of me is like, oh my God, like I know that this problem is huge already, right? Like the digital only online gaming is such a big portion of how games exist today. Um, but I think that, uh, so I think that it's actually really, really tricky for a variety of different legal reasons. Um, and I think that like the, uh, like one, some of them just have to, like has to do with what Andrew was saying about like, what is the game that you're preserving? You know, we do the, the 1201 video game exemption does cover uh, sort of uh, uh, circumvention for the purpose of basically recreating like just matchmaking services, which does not cover digital only and online gaming in any entirety, but is at least better than nothing. Um, but it does mean that like, because many of these games are sort of reliant on information from a server owned by a video game developer, like it's very difficult to possibly impossible to sort of preserve them as complete works without that. Um, even aside from the, sometimes the legal challenges. Uh, and so I think that 
here, what I would say is also, if you're thinking about doing this, like if you're interested in the legal challenges of digital only online gaming, I would love to talk to you um, because I would love an excuse to kind of try and think through all of them. Um, but I think that they are really significant and it is both from a 1201 perspective, but also from a way the way copyright law works and the expectations that people have about the way that folks engage with copyrighted works. Um, Brandon seems to be unfrozen, so I'll, I'll stop vamping now. <laughs> that was awesome, and I am un, I'm unfrozen caveman lawyer now, but um, I don't know why my connection is unstable. Um, uh, digital on, digital online only media frightens and confuses me for sure. It is like and and digital only games and online games are such uh they're canaries in the coal mine for actually a much bigger you know phenomenon a whole universe of like ebooks and streaming only audio and video and you know uh, i won't what i could i could talk about this problem for a long time and i bet we could have a, a whole nother panel about it but suffice to say something has happened in the way that media is distributed and the combination of that change from owning to from owning a physical thing that you control to leasing access to a thing that's on somebody else's computer is going to is in the process of completely scrambling all of our expectations about copyright and like how can you own something and preserve something in that scenario as a library I don't know, um, and and I don't know if anyone does, and it's a problem that a lot of organizations are starting to think about and work on, though, for what it's worth, and um, and we can find allies uh, all throughout our institutions because it's such a big problem. Yeah, I mean, that's really what my job primarily is thinking about, is digital games, why I'm digital games curator, not just curator of electronic games. So, I mean, really, it's going to be working with developers, all of that that has been traditionally important is equally as important for this, if not more so. Uh, you know, we have a collection of material from Don Daglo, who is a real pioneer in the video game industry, uh, which includes materials from ne Neverwinter Nights, one of the first online uh, role-playing games, Quantum Space. We have actual turn readouts of the game, but even then we don't have access to everything. And then even so, what does everything mean? What are the other libraries, the technologies that go into even beginning to preserve a game like that? Uh, there, there's some great questions coming up about communities, so I'm going to hold off, but communities are going to be a, a big part of what needs to grow for video game preservation. Um, I, I'm going to add one thing tacking onto what uh, Andrew was saying about community that I think uh, we don't have a lot of examples of this kind of preservation happening at the scale in like libraries institutions, but it is happening out in the world in non institutional settings. Uh, there was a really interesting example recently there was an online game I think it was uh, Shin Megami Tensei Imagine was the game it was a uh, an online role playing game that went you know was taken offline a few years ago. Uh, a fan community uh, reconstructed the servers themselves and began rerunning their own servers for the game. And uh, did not just get a takedown request, but got sued by the rights holder for copyright infringement. Um, I don't know how that translates to a library setting, except to say that um, companies don't seem super amenable with people reconstructing their servers without permission. Um, that's the only example I can think of. In, well, Andrew Scott is a... So I actually have a, a legitimate example that I, I think yeah. most people don't know about. Uh, so Nexon Computer Museum, uh, you know, sponsored, funded by the Nexon Video Game Company in South Korea. Uh, back in 2014, they revived the 1996 version of uh, Kingdom of the Winds, Kingdom of Winds, uh, depending on exactly, uh, you know, what, what you're looking at. And that included, you know, rebuilding source code, uh, finding source code client segments here and there, and actual user data as well to where you could jump into one of those old accounts from the 1990s and actually see how it was. Is that the same thing as making a, a Kingdom of the Winds from 1996 playable as it was in 1996. Not not really, but I, I do want to highlight the work that they did because I think that's one of the few examples uh, other than maybe Blizzard with the World of Warcraft Classic, which again, isn't the same. I think the Nexon Computer Museum has the best example of what uh, MMO preservation could be. But again, guess who made Kingdom of the Winds? Nexon. So there's a reason why they were able to do that and get that sort of access. So 
but it, it's a great example. I, I highly recommend people read about it because it, they're the only ones like it. Yeah, and I'll just note, uh, you know, in the my cyber law clinic capacity, not affiliated with my representation of SPN, we do represent folks who get CNDs um, for uh, preserving these kinds of works. Um, so if you know folks, call me. Yeah, literally, we've we've worked with folks who get who've gotten CNDs from video game developers. Um, I can't promise it will always go well, um, but uh, you know, I think. I think part of it is that this idea, you know, I think for me also part of it feels like a story about kind of education of developers and just having conversations with developers, especially about the idea that like for this game where like, you know, um, you know, literally fans are recreating the servers themselves. Like people spend hundreds and thousands of hours of their time, like trying to basically rebuild this thing. It's like, is this really like, you know, do you really need to be doing these kinds of enforcement actions? And I think like that's a story that translates well into conversations about preservation as well. Um, at the same time that I think like Brandon, I'm a little uncomfortable with the idea that we're sort of relying on kind of developer, either developers either not suing or being uh, amenable um, for preservation purposes, in part because like, you know, it speaks, it makes me worry about all the works that developers don't want to, don't want to continue to exist or don't want to allow to exist in their original format. You know, I think um, about something like, you know, <laughs> uh, um, uh, like I'm totally, it's, it's Cyberpunk 2077, right? Or am I, okay, uh, right? Like in some ways, like I'm kind of curious if like, I would love the preserved version of the, the, the game of that that shipped the day zero um, because I would love to be able to talk exactly about what it looked like when, uh, when that game shipped versus the version that ended up getting patched and was more successful. Like that's an important part of video game history, right? Or something like the original version of No Man's Sky, right? Games that have been really changed afterwards. Um, but developers may in not be in their best interest to sort of preserve those kinds of works. So I think even realistically very much agreeing with the, the rest of the panel that I think like developer, uh, working with developers is this like important story about how to actually do the stuff in practice. I think there are real reasons to be reluctant of that as our sort of like complete way forward as for digital only online gaming. And just to quickly add to that, not to belabor this question, but uh, anytime I acquire a game for the museum's collection i if it's a digital game particularly on steam i will back up that version of the game that way at least we have that and sometimes i go back using steam depot and download old versions of of the games if they have something uh interesting in them but again how can you do that in an automated process that's sustainable it's not so Excellent. So um, we do have a question about access, but I think this is a really good segue into discussing um, community and collaboration. So I'm going to kind of jump to that and we're going to come back to the remote access one later. Um, so one of our community and collaboration questions was, how do you work with communities and people who break locks? Um, are those processes that the VGHF or Strong can or would do in-house? And do you ever seek external help to compile source code? It definitely links back to that previous question about remote access because actually working with somebody to compile source code and that sort of thing would be great, uh, except can we legally share source code? I know Phil will jump in shortly with that because that's a big project BGH or BGHF is doing, uh, but we would like to develop processes and that sort of thing, but just the sheer amount of games required. I think we lean heavily on the community. The same tools that we use to back up a game are the same tools that pirated community, piracy communities use to back up their games. Mm -hmm. uh, same with protecting the secure ROM on the disc or, or whatever it may be when we're doing it. Uh, we lean heavily on them. Uh, it's not always clear, can I go to the internet and download a cracked version of the game and use that? Probably not. Uh, but that has its own implications of, are we expected to do this all by ourselves anyway? That said, we do compile source code in-house when possible. Uh, it's not always possible, but I've revived games that never came out using the source code. So that's more of a personnel and time issue than anything else. But no, yeah, agreeing with what Andrew said, uh, it's not a like uh, an answer I think people want to hear. But yeah, a lot of the tools that we have to use are things that originated out of people doing video game piracy, out of just folks in the community needing to like break protections on things for various reasons. Um, there's, you know, games that uh, I can think of specific games that like cannot run on modern systems except with a 
you know, suspicious cracked replacement executable that's floating around on a somewhat suspect website. And that's just kind of the way it is sometimes, um, just because that's the folks who've been putting in the work for it. Um, it's, there's no one size of print. Eh, I can't tell. Oh my God. There's no one size fits all approach to doing game preservation like this. And yeah, we are reliant on folks who've already figured these things out. There is, you know, a community of people who work with Nintendo 64 games, a community of people who work with, as Andrew knows, original Xbox games. There's like all these sub communities that have their own expertise working with different kinds of digital rights management. And yeah, we can't in some cases just give them a big repository and say, hey, work with this because yeah, there are a lot of barriers to, you know, just like distributing source code. There's a lot of resistance within the video game industry. There's still a lot of barriers about, is this okay to do? that we are working on. Like we have a committee that meets occasionally that talks about, you know, what we can do to move the conversation forward on providing access to source code to, you know, other parties to study or work with. Um, but just like, I think it was in the 2018 when during the process for getting additional DMCA exemptions, there was a mention of, you know, getting exemptions for being able to work with affiliate archivists and the, Copyright Office didn't seem super enthused about that idea. Um, so perhaps directly working, being like, hey, here's a thing, can you crack this for me? Like, perhaps that's a little bit outside the bounds of what institutions can do. But in terms of like, you know, resources that already exist that people have been building that happen to match up with the systems we're already looking at, like, absolutely, we use that and we use that in-house. We just, you know, we're three employees at the Video Game History Foundation and don't really have the bandwidth to develop that stuff on our own. So it's absolutely collaborative with people who've already figured these things out. So you mentioned um, working with different groups. Um, and I think that does kind of play into the remote access. So our, our last sort of legal oriented question, well, most legal was, um, how does remote access to materials work across international borders? Uh, the person who asked this question, um, is in Denmark and use the example that they do not have fair use laws in Denmark, but they are by law allowed to quote unquote pirate games that they don't have in the national collection at the Royal Danish Library. So what would, what are thoughts on that international remote access? For us, we're bound by US laws. So that's kind of what, what sets the basis anyway. And then I think we refer to other people making sure that they know what they're doing for their own side. But again, that we can provide access to certain certain sorts of documentation, certain sorts of art artwork, that sort of thing. Uh, but we can't provide access to the video games themselves or the source code for those. So uh, we would like to, in some way, shape, or form. We just can't. So we, we just go by our own laws and hope for the best. Yeah, I'd, I'd be curious um, if, if Kendra has a, a, a deeper take on this than mine. My take on, on international sharing is that, that is, it's a little bit of a mess, you know, in some ways, uh, in some ways, I mean, um, Andrew's, Andrew's approach is exactly right in every way, which is, you know, the law that mostly matters for you is the law where you are. You know, you always start from that principle. Copyright is territorial. It is the law of each individual country. There's no transnational copyright law. Um, you know, the, the only law that, that applies is the law of each country. But, right, along comes the internet. Uh, and, 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 it, and it throws up all kinds of questions about sort of, you know, where are you legally when you're online? You know, who might have standing to sort of drag you into a court in some other country because of what you've done online that was accessible in that other country. Um, and there are wonky kind of hyper-technical arguments to be made um, to try to wiggle things in one way or another. Um, but I think the honest answer is that it's still kind of a mess. Um, and and no, any lawyer that tells you it's easier than that um, I would love to hear about it. And, and, and maybe Kendra is that lawyer. Give me, give, give no, me. I, I, I wish I had a nice easy answer. I think in some ways my answer is similar to Brandon's. I also think from just like a peer risk analysis perspective, one of the other things to think about is a principle that I think comes from uh, sort of more general kind of conversations about jurisdiction online, which is sort of a boots on what I what we call the boots on the ground principle, which is if you don't have anybody who's affiliated with your institution or your you know the person who's doing something uh, in a particular jurisdiction, um, you know uh, the 
uh, and you never want to go there, uh, then you know the question of a uh, potential judgment against your institution in that particular jurisdiction is maybe less important um, than it would be otherwise. Now, of course, like it's harder to make the argument that like, ah, oh, yeah, I'll just like have this court judgment against the library in South Korea, and no one from the library will ever go to South Korea. Like that may not be particularly compelling uh, to a library's general counsel or its board of trustees or whatever. Um, but I do think one thing just to think about realistically here is that like, it's very easy, like for the same reason Brandon and I were talking about at the beginning to get caught up in the like, oh my God, it's so complicated. We're never going to know the answer. Um, and when you're doing risk analysis and lose sight of the, wait, is there a lot of realistic risk here? And it's just worth noting that like, as far as we know, and I'd love to hear otherwise, um, you know, no preservation institution within the United States has gotten sued for copyright infringement for software or video game preservation. Um, and I think that like, you know, to me, like, I'm not saying this is, I, I don't want to think about this as the like missing a flight principle, you know, the people who are like, oh, if you've never missed a flight, you get to the airport too early. Like, that's not my, that's not my framework. Um, but I do think it speaks to the degree to which these are not, this is not litigation folks are bringing. And that, you know, when you're thinking about risk, it's important to think about the risk of actual litigation in addition to kind of these kind of more technical answers about like, okay, like which body of law applies. So realistically, if, you know, you're, if the chances of, you know, actual copyright enforcement in the context that you're talking about are quite low, then, you know, uh, spending tons and tons of time trying to figure out about sort of like how exactly remote access law works um, in terms of international borders may not be the most uh, fruitful way to spend on like collection categorization. And I mentioned briefly in chat too, like we we have anybody who's coming to access collections sign an image use policy that goes over policies, you know, our interpretation of the fair use laws and all that. Uh, but it's also worth noting that's not always going to be legal issues in this case. Uh, can also be other issues in terms of relationships with uh, certain, you know, potential donors, uh, whether that's monetarily or of materials. There can be all sorts of restrictions that go outside the legal that may ultimately impact remote access in some ways too. So, you know, legal is certainly the biggest step. If we can get past that, then yes, we can start thinking about it. But it's not the only step. So it's just something I, I try to bring up to, you know, be realistic about, you know, even if the law changes, that it's not going to be tomorrow that you get access to everything. Excellent. Um, so going back to ways that the community can be brought together, um, and Andrew and Phil, you might have some really good actionable suggestions for this, but what are some solutions for uniting different organizations together, especially ones that have different ambitions and missions in order to collaborate on preservation or collectively collaborate with the games industry? I think I have kind of an interesting, unusual answer for this that might be different from Andrew's because I think the Video Game History Foundation sort of institutional history comes from a different place from, say, the Museum of Play or Stanford Archives or something like that. Um, we, I don't want to say we came out of the collector community, but our founder, Frank Cifaldi, you know, was a game collector, was involved in retro gaming community spaces. And I think in those areas, there often has been a different approach to how to think about these kind of questions. Um, you know, I think with, you know, the existence of groups like SPIN, you know, there, there has always been a bit of a, I don't want to say in like scholarly community, but there has always, you know, there, there's been some interest in institutional collaboration, even if there has been framework for it. Within the game collection community, I don't want to say things are more, I don't, I don't know what we're looking for here, but like there has always been a sense, I think, there, that there may be some uh, greater competition between people, that people are sharing resources, but it is also, you know, people showing up and setting up their own booths at retro shows and things like that. It's a bit of a different atmosphere than libraries collaborating together. I think we've reached a point where we're now all deep enough into this to realize that this is a shared thing we need to work on together. And there's obviously always going to be some, you know, things butting up against each other, missions running into each other, people's different priorities. But like, I think when it comes to some of these larger questions, like dealing with the, you know, what to do with source code, these are things that are best tackled together. Um, our, our founder, Frank, and, you know, our co-directors, Frank and Kelsey, they like to say that, like, it's not like video game preservation is a solved problem, but, like, if you really wanted to, you could download a bootleg copy of pretty much any, like, you know, Sega Genesis game or something like that. So the point, the, the stage of, you know, people having to go out and find new games to preserve, like, that's increasingly becoming less of an issue. As we start to deal more with these big questions, it's like, all right, we have this big collection of games now, 
Now, what do we do? There's no way for anyone to make individual headway on that. So I think even folks who previously may have been going their own way on this, I think that there's a, a greater shared mission now in the sense that we have bigger questions that we have to tackle together because it's going to involve institutional level change, legal level change. Um, I think we are just now hitting that in the last couple of years, but I think there that has been it's not really an actionable thing, but just the fact that we are now butting up against those problems that can't be solved by individual people working on their own. No, it feels directly on for all that. You know, I think there is a difference between a game collector going into a museum or archive world and a museum that went into game collecting as the strong did. Uh, you know, all those issues that come up though are ultimately going to be the same. It's just the order you're tackling them are, are, are quite different. Uh, that said, you know, as spin itself, you know, that's a big deal to, to get a lot of us under a ton of different umbrellas together, but also to make it clear that this isn't just a video game uh, thing. You know, Brandon was talking about, you know, the yes, there are these kind of, and Kendra for that matter, talking about, you know, yes, video games have their own separate issues, but they're not all separate issues. You know, there's things that we have to solve together. We don't have to go into this alone. And, you know, we've set up different calls. There's been different conferences. I think video game talks at, you know, just general archivist conferences, any sort of conferences are becoming more and more common. So I, I think as those sorts of things grow, you know, as Phil was saying, collectively, we can actually start to tackle the big issues, you know, collecting games themselves. If your goal is just to collect, that can be fairly simple. You know, even collecting game development documentation that can be pretty simple because we a lot of us have done that on our own before we were at an institution. Uh, but then what's the next step? How do we solve these actual issues of preservation, long-term preservation? That's where when we come together, we can hopefully figure this all out. I think a useful comparison point too is uh, I'm not involved in the world of like rare books. I know that's its whole kind of separate thing. I have a friend visiting this week who's in the world of rare books and has been sharing all sorts of anecdotes with me and just the the interesting relationships between like, you know, the collectors of rare books and people who are the book sellers and the kind of tense things that happen in like the ex libris listserv I've heard all sorts of things about. Um, I think we, there, there's a unification in the game world in the sense that like there is not an existential threat of like, hey, if we don't act soon, books will disappear. Like that's not like, like the concept of books is not in danger in the same way that like that's kind of a unifying force for a lot of the game related preservation institution that the questions we're facing are like, this stuff is going to be gone and inaccessible. And how do we deal with this in a way that I think is less pressing for other mediums, I think that that sort of the big, you know, sort of Damocles dangling uh, tech concerns for dealing with games um, have brought us together too. I think that's been one of the unifying forces for that. And just to add to the collaboration that is ongoing, I mean, I work with the University of Washington who is working with Video Game History Foundation on a big metadata project. The source code project that Video Game History Foundation is taking part in right now, leading the way. Uh, I am also helping with that when possible. So we really are a collaborative group of people. We want to work with more. You know, I think we've all set up panels and, and various talks with uh, different you know, people involved with game preservation. I was setting up one who was a scholar, you know, me being in a museum, and another who was at a big video game studio. So that collaboration is happening. And that's probably the best thing you could possibly want to see happening. Because if that wasn't happening, I think you should all be more concerned. But here we yeah, are. And I don't mean to like, you know, I feel like on some of these panels, like I'm the constant newbie because I have not been doing video game preservation work for that long. But on the other hand, I did start doing video game preservation legal work in 2014, which is a long time ago at this point. And I do think like just even the fact that like there are these kinds of convening spaces is something that I like, like I remember when I first, first read Henry Lowood's like preserving virtual worlds re report, which like is this beautiful report, which kind of comes to the conclusion, like this is not going to happen. Right. Um, I, I'm paraphrasing wildly, but I think that's true to the spirit. And I think a lot of those collaborations, the spaces that are needed for that kind of collaboration exist now in a way that at least if they'd existed in 2014 or 15, nobody I knew of, knew then seemed to know how to get me into them. Um, so that makes me really excited actually about sort of the next round of 1201 work and like how we continue kind of building out some of these legal tools because I think actually, you know, 
uh, historically in the video game preservation 1201 exemptions, I think it's been individual institutions kind of going at it alone a little bit. And I think like we always are more compelling when we work together, right? And I think that like that makes me excited about what we can achieve now that like folks have like SPN and other folks have and the Video Game History Foundation um, have and you know the strong have been building out these spaces in a more fulsome way. Excellent. Um, so we are getting right about the time to do community Q&A from this current group, but I do want to address the trends and I think that the two questions can kind of be merged a little bit um, into the idea of the types of efforts that smaller institutions or individuals can do versus larger institutions. The two trends that were addressed was um, regarding interest in graded video game collecting and then also in the forgery scandal. So how um, how can smaller institutions or smaller groups um, be able to develop these collections in light of the perception that the a larger institution should really be the one to take care of it? I think it comes down to scope in a lot of ways. You know, you don't have to collect every single thing, uh, which I think Phil will agree with. Uh, we aren't interested in graded video games either. You know, if one came, great. But otherwise, that has very little research value. So what is the thing that's going to have research value for your collection? That could be three games that are completely common. That's okay. Yeah, I, I think it's entirely use-based. If your idea for your museum is to have a wall of pristine copies of every video game, you're going to have to get into that like multi-thousand dollar graded video game market. If your goal is to have a copy you can put into a machine for someone to study, you can get a loose cartridge for fairly cheap still, um, with exceptions. Uh, but, but yeah, it, it's based a lot around that. Um, to go off the question about forgery, but for those who don't know what we're talking about, there was recently a scandal where a known dealer of like computer game antiquities, essentially, very early computer games have been caught uh, selling forgeries for years. Uh, Ethan just linked to it in chat. Um, the thing is, this isn't a problem unique to games, and it's also been happening in games for a long time. Um, our co-director, Kelsey Lewin, uh, runs a chain of video game stores in Seattle, and she can attest if you buy a copy of Pokemon on eBay, there's a very good chance it's a counterfeit, and this just happens. Um, the way that you combat it is community resources. It's you share how to identify fakes. Uh, you, you know, for cases like uh, this forgery scandal, a big reason it happened was that the person who was selling these things was operating kind of off the books and telling people to be quiet and was making up provably false provenance for all these games they were selling. So it's like, you combat this stuff by being open about it, sharing these resources with each other and talking about it. And that's accessible to small researchers to, and small institutions too. Um, so I think it's a, a, a openness about the resources we're working with, I think is one thing that's going to combat this too and make it easier for smaller institutions to get you know, a loose cartridge of whatever game they're looking for if they just need something to use in their collection. Yeah, and in terms of development materials and all that best left to larger institutions, you know, obviously I'm biased. Uh, you know, I, I think the Strong has the things that it needs to preserve games long term. But but really what that comes down to is the donors, you know, there are donors we work with who have donated elsewhere. At a, but the one thing that they want to see all the time is longevity. They want to know that their collection isn't going to end up on eBay or some other place. Uh, because they want to see their legacy preserved. You know, there's always that bit of selfishness to it of like, yeah, this is what I worked on. This is my legacy. I want to make sure. So I think even smaller institutions, particularly, you know, if you're in uh, Bethesda and you want to work with a small developer, because there were tons of small developers in the Bethesda, Maryland area, you know, showing that you have the funding or, or the ability to keep those things long term will help you still in a way that you know, even the large institutions, it can be hard to argue uh, against, despite, you know, what I may think. Uh, but also in terms of the whole, you know, article about the, the pirated games, there's lots of things that we or smaller institutions can do. Can we have examples of those things that show here's why it was, or here's how it was bootlegged, directly having those? We have bootleg games in our collection. I know for a fact they're not all identified, uh, but we're working on that. So we can have those actual things in the collection and it can be an educational piece just like any other educational thing in a museum could be. Uh, so I think there is an importance in preserving that legacy without also encouraging it or misleading what that history is. 
I'll, I'll add a very small thing, which is I'm a big fan of like diversity and redundancy in in all kind of collection and preservation, right? And so, you know, lots of lots of small institutions collecting according to their own interests, you know, is key for any kind of cultural preservation effort. Um, you can't count on the big people to always know everything that's going to be important in a hundred years or to always do the best job. So. I think there's always room for diversity and for small players. And digital holdings can be distributed among many institutions. You know, there's no reason why you can't have access in here, and but also at a different country. Why not? It's digital. Excellent. Well, thank you to Kendra, Brandon, Andrew, and Phil. Um, we do still have some time, so I appreciate you guys talking a little bit past um, for some of our questions. So we've got some from the forum and also in the chat uh, for our attendees. If you have additional questions, feel free to add them into the chat box in Zoom, and we'll try to get to them as much as possible. Um, so one of the ones early on from the chat, and Andrew, you did kind of answer this a little bit, but is anyone preserving pirate communities, um, such as websites, how-to guides, blogs, forums, et cetera? Yeah, and I mentioned in the chat for those that missed that, you know, some of that is best deciding where we should place our resources to preserve those things. Uh, you know, Internet Archive presumably, you know, kind of focuses on that sort of thing. That said, we've dabbled in other sorts of digital communities in general, speedrunning communities. Some of those things would be considered pirated things, you know, modified ROMs, that sort of thing. So, so we definitely dabble in it. Uh, and we definitely back up especially important guides that we think will be useful long term. Uh, we also accept donations of that sort of thing. So if a uh, there's a pirated most people would see it mostly as a pirate community, but it's more of game saves and that sort of thing. That's one that I've worked with more recently that we're working on figuring out exactly where we're going to place it. Uh, but that sort of collection is coming soon. I also just feel like remiss, at, even after all of my don't worry so much about the legal risk lectures to just note that if you're thinking, if folks are thinking about preserving this kind of stuff, it's also worth thinking about like what the risks are to folks who participated of this kind of preservation, because if what you're preserving is effectively a record of stuff that people were doing that was less than legal, um, you know, there may be consequences for them about an institution keeping a copy of it when otherwise they could take down that content if in response to a legal threat. Um, so I think that, you know, one thing to think about here is I think, you know, it is just really important to be thoughtful as we engage in some of these kinds of preservation work to just remember that like, you know, uh, hopefully like it never comes to the point where it's an issue at all, but there are circumstances in which certain kinds of archival information are used against uh, against the people who sort of wanted to contribute to history, and that that's and that's a, like a part of part of this story. And we've had that happen for non-pirated stuff too, where they're just like, "Please remove my name from the finding aid." Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, Patricia asked, do any of you know if there's an individual working or a group in the UK that's working on video game preservation? Uh, there's the National Video Game Museum in the UK. I, I don't know what they're doing on the legal side of things, but they, they're building a, a local collection as well. Okay. Um, what is we talked a little bit about like the digital and online but what if anything is being done to preserve mobile games after servers are shut down oh i just want to i want to like lift up what paul said on the chat hi paul um yeah the digital preservation coalition in the uk does uh cool work more generally and so you know i think they are uh you know uh despite operating and not in a fair use regime where you get people like me and brandon just being like go for it um that's that's not our line go for it carefully and thoughtfully um but uh the uh so i think that you know that's a that's a community to also uh be in touch with more generally uh mobile games though yeah that is that is an existential concern uh that there i think there we're all kind of struggling to figure out what to do with that uh andrew's got his phone there i see uh Wojcia is in the chat for this session i know that uh they also do a bunch of work um with uh preserving mobile games it's something the community and again i don't want to just say like oh community's taking care of it and just like you know push all game preservation problems aside but the scope of it is so big uh, i don't know how like even the strong deals of it at an institutional level but we depend on folks who are breaking these things 
Yeah, I mean, so much of it is so individualized. Even this phone here, it's from Korea. Great, I could figure out how to back this up, maybe. But then how can I actually make that accessible, let alone every other single phone that's out there? And it also just brings us into the, so, some of the challenges that we've seen with previous digital distribution style games, like the use of Teleview on the Super Famicom, where things were distributed digitally uh, and they were deleted often. You know, one of the first things you do, if you don't trade in your phone, you probably format it. So that removes the text messages, the pictures, everything else you had on it but also the games that were on it. Uh, and some of them do require network access, even going back to the early 2000s. Uh, so unfortunately it is such an individualized thing. You know, there was, a, there was a group of people buying up just random job lots of phones from Japan, uh, just hoping that there'd be games left over, let alone like no idea how to access them, but just hoping that there are games there in the first place. That's hard for us to justify going out and buying 300 mobile phones and maybe three of them have video games on them. So that's one of the, the areas where I think there needs to be some sort of collaboration because we, we can't rely obviously on developers, many of whom aren't around anymore because mobile game developers often didn't last that long. Uh, so it, it's challenging for sure. This is going to be kind of a two-part question because um, we have two things sort of feed into each other. Um, is there a consensus on what it means to preserve a video game? And then kind of as a side of that, is video game preservation focused on preserving the ability of future peoples to uh, play these preserved games or mainly for, um, sorry, let me throw the rest of the question up. Um, the interactive nature of video games works in preservation. So. I think we talked about this a lot in the first part, uh, so that's worth going back to for the sake of time. But we, we lay out what does it mean for us at The Strong to preserve a video game. And obviously the games would be ideal to preserve some sort of playable thing would be awesome, but it's just not realistic. So what else can we preserve? Uh, I know Video Game History Foundation has game development documents like we do, magazines, trade catalogs, all of that stuff. Uh, but also video of gameplay is something that we do. Uh, how can we preserve the player reaction? My colleague always refers to like, how do you preserve a game of baseball? Do you preserve the stadium, the fans, everything as it was that day? No, you really can't. So you have to preserve all these other things around it. Uh, and that will have the most complete view uh, because even you know, if you do preserve a playable copy, that doesn't mean that you've preserved the game. You know, I could go online and play Star Wars Galaxies today using a private emulator doesn't make it the same as Star Wars Galaxies was back in the day, let alone just that shared learning. All that happens with it. You know, the playable thing is important at the core of a lot of what we do, but that alone isn't enough. And quite frankly, it also will be missing for a, for many, many games, especially going forward. Yeah, basically what Andrew said. Uh, I think in the past, especially in the game community, there's been a tendency for things to just appear where it's like, hey, this thing showed up here it is. It's like, great. This tells us nothing. It's like an incomplete prototype of something. It's like, it matters so much to get the context surrounding and to understand what it is. Even having a perfect copy of the game does not necessarily preserve the game in a way that's meaningful for people trying to study it. Um, I, I sort of missed the question about uh, if we're studying, if we're preserving for, for play versus for, I, I think for like for research or examination needs, I think that's a good example is like, if a thing's out in the world, that's, you know, people can play it and that's great. But I think we, we need more than just a thing someone can put into an emulator for a couple minutes, say, cool, and then move on from, um, which I think is what we're focusing on in terms of collecting mostly around contextualizing materials instead of the games themselves. I also think that like one important example about like why sort of play and scholarship are sort of, I know that I don't think anyone here thinks they're mutually exclusive, but I always like to emphasize that is like one of our experts in the most recent 1201 rulemaking talked about sort of like dialogue trees um, as this like really comp like important sort of uh, way to study like for example LGBTQ characters in games and sort of like if you don't if you only see part of the dialogue tree you may actually never get the dialogue where the character comes out as queer or as trans or you may not get the rest of the sort of context around it and so I think that one of the challenges around talking about kind of um, you know certain kinds of non-playable uh, archival uh, copies is that the thing that you need to the the moment you need for scholarship may only really be achievable through kind of a form of play 
Um, and that makes it really complicated if we, what we're thinking about is things like sort of screenshots or videos or even like uh, the stuff associated with games. And it's one of the reasons that I think I personally like want to try to think, want work on continuing trying to think about how to remove some of these legal barriers because I, it may not be like, it may not be feasible from a sort of like a uh, big picture technical or logistical perspective to preserve all the all of the games in playable ways, but I do think building some of the tool sets and and uh, the ability to go back and play parts of games is like really really important from a scholar like a scholarly angle. And, and also supporting community members who are making tools to access things that aren't playable. You know, some of those dialogue trees we may be able to access through other means. Uh, so that will be, I think, increasingly important as we are unable to play certain games. Okay, I hate to be this person because this conversation has been amazing again, but we are out of time and I want to be respectful of um, all of our panelists and everyone who um, has taken time to come to this. Um, for our speakers, is there anything else that she wanted to say before we totally wrap it up? We knew what would happen with Stadia. <laughs> it happened. That's what there is. Okay, um, I would like everybody uh, or to invite everyone to either unmute or use the clap emoji to um, please give a round of applause for our speakers today and thank them for joining us. Mm -hmm. um, our speakers have also said that if you have additional direct questions for them, you are welcome to reach out and ask them. I know we still had some questions in the chat and some questions in the form that didn't get answered. So do feel free to reach out directly if you would like. Thanks, everybody. We really appreciate everyone who has come. This has been another phenomenal forum. Uh, it is has been recorded and that recording should be available on our YouTube channel and our website within a couple of weeks. We do have a brief follow-up survey that we're gonna be dropping in the chat or may already be there. Um, Please let us know if you have enjoyed the forum, if you have thoughts about uh, today's events or ideas for future forum topics or partnerships that we should pursue, pursue for another forum event. And the Community Engagement Collaborative would really love to hear your feedback. So thank you again for joining us and we hope to see you at the next SPIN forum. <laughs>